Welcome everyone. Good morning. We are happy to celebrate this day. And as our slogans mention is that the struggle of the indigenous peoples is the struggle for the future of humanity. That is why we are here together today. And we are very pleased that the day arrived. I'm going to change the format so we can really watch the slideshow. So today, August 9, in the International Day of the Indigenous People, we celebrate with this webinar this day. And since our, the, our three panelists are Spanish speakers, in, in respect to this woman leader, I will be conducting this event in Spanish. So everyone who speak English or French, you can access translation here, simultaneous translation. Today, as we know worldwide, we're celebrating and all our brothers and sisters from the indigenous peoples are struggling against the loss and extractivism. Especially today, we will have worldwide events. For instance, there is a coincidence. Yesterday, the summit of Belém in Brazil began, where a leaders from Latin America, air presence, are discussing the future of our. Amazon. And this is related to the worry of our indigenous people, brothers and sisters in the Amazon area. So today we will be hearing from three powerful indigenous women who will be telling us their experience in the regarding the protection of the forest and biodiversity. So I, I am going to change the slide. So as we know, we all have our translation in, in English and French, in the lower part of your screen. Please rename yourself first name, country, and organization. And please mute your microphone when not speaking. And if you can, please turn on your camera so we can see you if you have a good connection, especially at the end of the event where we, have, we will have a picture. As I said before, we have interpretation available. Next slide. Sorry, but it, it looks like I have some issues, technical issues here. I guess I, I will have to stop and with the presentation and start again. Okay, there you go. It looks like I only can show it this way because it I have issues, it technical issues or connection issues. So 
The objective of this event is to exchange knowledge and strengthen the leadership of indigenous women in community conservation and traditional knowledge as an effective response to forest and biodiversity degradation. Basically, first, we will have our colleague Bernarda Pessoa, then Modesta Medina, and finally, Muscui Tissoy. They will have around 20 minutes for Q&A. For questions, we will already send her. First, I would like to talk about Bernarda Pessoa. She is a leader of the community of Santa Rosa from the Pueblo Com. She is a human rights defender from the collect Women's Collective of Gran Chaco. She is a member of Canamuri, an organization that brings together peasant and indigenous women. She has fought tirelessly with her community against eucalyptus plantations in the territory of the Com people. She, in 2021, she won the Dignity Award for the Lifetime Achievement granted by, by the Human Rights Coordinating Committee of Paraguay. Bernarda is a craftswoman, mother, and grandmother. So, Bernarda, we invite you to speak to start your presentation answering the two questions we sent to you before can you see me good morning Congratulations to the rest of the women presented today here. Congratulations on the Indigenous Day, Indigenous People's Day. My name is Bernarda, as she said. And we are here in Paraguay. I speak a calm language in our community, and I'm a leader woman from the calm people. I also have a organizative responsible, responsibility today and territorial organizer. So this day means a lot for all of us who are permanently struggling in the territories. And we can exchange today because we are in a political scenario today in which we need a strength and support alliances with other organizations national national or international speaking because of the struggle we are conducting our permanent struggle is resistance inside the community who has been suffering for more than three years, this mega project of eucalyptus and has been degraded in the land. The land has been dried up. The plants has been dried up. So we cannot Enjoy fruits like mango, cantaloupe, guava. Uh, we cannot enjoy any more fruits like years before because of the installation of these mega projects. So today in this commemoration day, we, we express our continuing struggle inside our territory. We also are working directly with the young people inside the community. Thank you.
Sí. I think Juana no la, is no la veo. lost her connection. Well, she comes back. I get. I think I have a very bad connection and audio, but I would like to thank Bernarda because of her words and also because she was willing to share her experience in the hair community to get to know firsthand what is going on there with the Eucalyptus project, especially in the Paraguayan Chaco, which is a not well-known region, but nevertheless is so important the struggle they are conducting there. Let's go ahead with the second woman leader, Modesta Medina. I'm going to read briefly her bio, telling you about her. Sorry, my connection here is not very well. Please be patient. Can you listen to me? I'm back. Yes. Sí, sí, se te escucha, Valentina. Cualquier cosa, yo también podría leer la introducción de Modesta. So let's get to know who's Modesta Medina. She is from Bolivia, from the Guarani indigenous people. She is a leader from Laguna Chica, which is in Tarija department in, of the Bolivian Chaco. Uh, I have actively participated in the struggles to defend Guarani land or TCO as they call in Bolivia. And she has participated also to defend culture from her local community of Jackie Wea in the Grand Chaco. In 2001, Guarani Woman Leaders brought a lawsuit before the country's agroenvironmental court to obtain land titled for their ancestral line. Together with other Indi Guarani indigenous women leaders, Modesto has confronted landowners in the area with the forest of the region from industrial soybean. She was part of the group of women who wrote the book Laguna Chica. First ancestral territory, Uh, organized by women Guarani leaders in 2022, which recounts the struggle to recover their ancestral line. Thank you, Modesta, for being here today. You have the floor. Modesta, you're in silence. Could you open your mic? It's muted. Can you listen to me now? Sí. My name is Modesta Medina. I'm from Bolivia. And congratulations because today is Indigenous People's Day. And thank you. For inviting me today as and as you said from the book. 
you mentioned, it is very important for us to make known this book you mentioned. I am from Laguna Chica and it, it has not been easy to have the space. We continue our struggle to consolidate our goals. I am always calling my sisters to continue to struggle, to go forward, to recover. This land historically was ours, but the land owners have taken it from us. But now we are recuperating them. And this is what is stronger. I transmit to everyone that they cannot be afraid so we can get well what is ours back. Four days ago, we entered to Previa, and thanks God, there was not as much as problems like in Laguna Chica. In Laguna Chica, we have to confront with people, but in the last one, it was not that bad. The violence or, or this, the fight has not been that bad. Sisters are calm now. Thanks to the institution of Sinca, they are going to build a water tank for the brothers and sisters. And thanks God this project is advancing well the Sinca institution too. Modesta. But as I wanted to ask you, after the publishing of your book from Laguna Chica, that tells about the recovery of the ancestral land after so many years of struggle, how has been the situation for all of you? How is the community now? Well, the achievement is we are calm and in peace now because the land is ours. The land owners deforest the land, deforested the land, but now we are taking care of it and we are living peacefully now. And what has been doing right now? Sí, yo también escucho como entrecortada. So it looks like Valentina is having connection issues. My my audio is very bad because I am in Kenya in a rural community. Sorry about that. Hello.
Modesta, we can listen to you very well. Do you, can you listen to me? Yes, I can. I was asking about the community and what is the struggle to recover the forest? Because I remember that the last years you were telling us about native trees from the Paraguayan charcoal. So now I would like to know an update about this forest and the territory in this year. Well, well, the, the trees are growing up. We have been able to buy seeds of algarobo. We have been able to forest again to bring it back. We have been trying to avoid the death of these plants and they are growing very well now. Because we need to take care carefully of the plants because they give us life. And this is a form of resistance for us to, but the worry, my, my own personal worry of what any woman leader the biggest worry is that the neighbors are taking the the way the the wind has been creating complicated situations for all of us because the neighbors there keep cutting the trees. They are, they are affecting. And this is very worried because maybe they have a permit for to, to, to destroy the forests and the trees. Animals are not closer to the area anymore. They are far away. As Warani people, we take care of the animals too. And it's very sad for us, the situation now. We used to listen to charatas and we cannot listen anymore because they are afraid because of the, because they are afraid and they go farther from the area. This is a worry for us. That is why we need to bring back the forest to plant more seeds. I always insist on this with my sisters in Laguna Chica. We have now uh, a water tank of 16,000 liters, so we can have uh, water when there's not rain. We're also buying water because we only have these 16,000 liters of water. Because in, in Laguna Chica, they wanted to build a water, another water and tank, but it was not possible. In, in this area, we are five community. We have five communities together. And the water has been not enough, but this water tank that we get because of Sinka community, uh, we have some water, but the, but the, we're still worried because that won't be enough water for all of us. We, we were trying to beat a well, but it has not been possible. Also, 
it looks like there is a project to have a highway and a tunnel in the area. And here in Aguarawe, we have a water reserve and this could be affected. And that's another preoccupation we have to what I need people in Aguarawe. But looks like they are going to build a bridge and a tunnel. And that's, that will definitely affect the water, not only for the water need people, but for the whole community. In 2010, we protested, we have a demonstration about this project to build a tunnel. We try to protest in order to stop the, the building, the construction, because that is a water source for us. But anyway, they will destroy it. I have listened in the news that the president, that of course, they will be the tunnel there. They don't care. That's one new preoccupation, one new worry, because we can see the dry season arriving sooner. In San Antonio, we don't have water anymore in those communities. That is the drought is arriving. There's no more water. This worry is not only from the Guarani people, but from the whole community in the Gran Chaco. And our sons and grandsons and granddaughters are the ones that are going to suffer with this situation. And that's why we try to call on sisters and brothers to, to stop. This is a great challenge we have right now. The land we were able to recover some of them from the land owners. But this is my biggest concern at in at this moment in the present. In Laguna Chica, I have now the peacefulness to live now we can be able to cultivate corn, poroto, and other seeds. And we do what we can to plant our subsistence plants for our daily food. And that's what, all we need is a space to plant so that we can be okay because where we used to live. If we didn't plant, we weren't able to support ourselves, but I feel glad now to have this space and to be saving the seeds for our own use because that's what we live off of. Thank you very much, Modesta, for your speech. I wanted to tell you about a little technical situation we have going on. Juana um, had got booted out of the meeting and now you are in the host role. So she needs you to admit her. And also we have Guillaume trying to to enter, but you're the only person who can allow people to come in. 
or you could pass the host to me. I don't know if you could do that so that I can have access. Sorry, everybody. I had problems with my internet and I got totally shut out of the meeting. I've only just now been able to come back in. I'm so sorry about that. Right now, I don't quite know where we're at in our meeting, but I am going to take up the host role again. Juliana, could you tell me who has presented? Modesta is about to finish her speech, but I was telling her that for some reason she, when you lost your connection, she ended up um, being the host of the meeting, and I didn't want to interrupt her during her speech, but you were asking to come in, and also we've got someone else who was trying to come in, Guillomar Rodriguez. And so I am asking, I don't know how she could pass the host to you or me because she's still the host. Could you make one of us the host so we can? Could you make us the host? Uh, either Juliana or me, please. You can reclaim the host, Juana, if you click on the three dots by Modesta's name. Okay, I'll try and do that. I am also not the host. I don't know if I can reclaim it. Hmm. Okay. Well, maybe someone. So in the meantime, we will invite Musku to do her speech. We're going to hear from her. She is from the Inga community in Putumayo, Colombia. And she works on traditional crops. She's a biologist and an environmental pedagogy expert. She does research on ethnobotany and culture and traditional knowledge. She is a teacher at the university level. She is a guardian of ancestral wisdom. And she knows about the use of traditional plants as medicine. She also works with artisan women and healers and doctors in the community. She is from Luna Pacha. Miss Kui, would you like to begin your presentation? Welcome and thank you for being here at the meeting. I'm from the Inga Manda community in Southern Colombia. And hello everybody. I'd like to send my greetings to all the colleagues around the table. And Modesta, it was so great to hear you. <clears throat> Thank you, Juana. Thank you, Valentina, for inviting me to participate in this event. And I will also thank the Global Forest Coalition, GFC. Yes, the Global Forest Coalition. 
And thanks for bringing me here today, August 9th. I'll share my reflections. As Bernarda and Modesta have said, we as indigenous people are concerned about the disappearance of traditional knowledge and our territories. And this is a like an SOS call, SOS signal for humanity. We need to retake ancestral wisdom. And that means all types of traditional wisdom. It's become fragmented as the indigenous peoples and communities are fragmented, but we have the roots of our communities and the rituals that connect us to the mother earth. We do dances in honor of the sun. And we say that it's a, we have a word called minga that we use for collective work when people come together. And if we need to do uh, a joint effort, we call it a minga. We need a we have mingas to plant our traditional crops and plants, and we need a minga of humanity right now to bring everyone together to work to solve these crises. And I'll talk about the threats that we have in our territory. I'm in southern Colombia, and right where I am, this is an ancestral territory where the Inga and Kamsa indigenous communities live. And I'm in the Inga community. This is a sacred space for us. And this is a place where we are in a transitional ecosystem between the forest and the valley. And this is an area that is very rich in water. You can walk here through the mountains and you find waterfalls every 20 minutes. There are so many uh, very clear and clean waterfalls, but we are threatened by mega mining. And this is a small territory. I can see the whole valley from here. It's quite small. And there are 25 mining concessions. Minas de Colombia has these mines. In 2015, there was a march. We were able to take one of the concessions away. And they're constantly interested in copper and nickel and other uh, minerals that can be found in our territory. And there's a Canadian company that's here. There are four polygons and part of it overlaps our area in the valley. And here in Putumayo, which is the capital of our department, this is an area where we have mega mining with all these different concessions and we have jaguars here. They are threatened and the whole area is threatened by these mining companies. And there's a project in South America that I heard about first in 2009 but I know it was planned far earlier than that to connect um, different highways and routes throughout South America. I think in 2010, the Ministry of Communication and Transportation in Colombia said publicly that they were doing this IRSA project to build highways and specifically here in the valley, 
we've got La Variente. That's supposedly going to be part of a, uh, an infrastructure connection with Brazil. And we don't know when this is going to happen. Sometimes they say it may be in 15 years or 60 years even. But we know that this is a threat to us. And there's a process to resist this and all of the development so that we can defend our territories. And these are threats, including carbon markets and carbon trading they're trying to do in our area. This happened during the pandemic and we don't know the status of these projects because they have not been shared with us. We've got the mining exploitation, Libero Cobre, the copper mine. And this is a very intense topic. It's hard to say this in public spaces. We've been in a process of defending our territory among the Kamsa and Inga women so that we can start to have a dialogue about our concerns in this territory. And there are many. There's the mega mining, the infrastructure projects, the Monsanto chemicals that are sprayed on plants. There's a lot of monoculture. And as indigenous women, we are healers and gardeners. And some people have said that it's okay to have these monocultures because they earn some money from it, but we're continuing to resist and to take care of our traditional crops and plants. We have medicinal plants from the Indian forest as well as the jungle because we're at this transitional ecosystem. And there's a lot of contamination. We've got a case near here where the monocultures are polluting the different um, water sources at the different springs that are here. And the Valley of Sibundoy has seen a lot of big changes. We've had clear cutting of the forests, dating back to colonization to build churches. And they have deforested very important mountains. There are lots of projects that are going on in Sibundoy. They're making an aqueduct. Oh, sorry, I was just reading a chat. And in some way, all of this that has occurred, it has an important starting point. There's a book by Victor Daniel Bonilla about the colonization process that was experienced in the South, in Southern Colombia. And so all of our traditional wisdom was prohibited in colonization, but we're now defending our identity and our knowledge and in all of this, it's also been essential to do so in a collective way. And so uh, we have our women's group, Kuzukui. We are taking care of our farm 
farms or our, our plants and our animals. And there was a decision to continue taking care of the chakras and many of the plants and the trees that grow here. We've been using our native seeds. And we are bringing these trees back, the native trees, transplanting them. And we've been making new chagras for the last 10 years. And our ancestors, our grandparents were upholding those traditional chagras and medicinal plants. So we can talk about a resistance as a community. And there's also a spiritual resistance that's going on. Listening to the voice of Mother Earth in order to defend spirituality. So as women, we also connect with the Mother Earth in such a deep way. And we say that when we're in resistance, we heal ourselves. We're not sick. We're talking about achieving harmony. And balancing our systems. We have the traditional symbols in our weavings. We call it chumbi. We use this tied around our waist. And we take care of our organs in our female bodies, just as we take care of the earth and we want to defend our territory. That's what we're doing because we women are the ones who give birth or we are giving birth to the new generations. And they also should be able to feel and enjoy this strength. And that is what we're doing, working with the new generations, with children in the Runapacha Collective, working on maintaining our ancestral languages with education and didactic processes. We're going to publish a book by the founders of the collective, the Kusikoi organization. That's a Quechua organization. The word Kusikoi means happiness. It means happiness. And it's part of our own philosophy. Our native philosophy that allows us to see things with our own eyes, see life through our own eyes and our own perspective. Moskoi, a question. How do you see the struggle for collective rights and the future of these struggles in Latin America? What are the perspectives that you have on this? Well, let's say in Colombia, at least, with the change in the national constitution, because we had a constitution from 1989. And back then, we indigenous people were considered like animals with no rights and no spirit. So we're retaking our rights. And human rights. We're beginning to open some doors so that our territories can also have collective rights. In my specific case, we can talk about the communities in Colombia and the creation of 
the indigenous councils, those have been strengthened and indigenous reserves. Sometimes reserves are used as spaces for cattle ranching and business. Those are just right on top of the reserves, those farms. And in this case, the mega mining Monsanto approaching on the reserves. So I don't think that the future is that secure. There's a certain part that we can secure, but other areas where the work is really incomplete. We have educational processes and we should ensure the collective protection of our traditional knowledge. But education, unfortunately, continues to be the traditional style education imposed based on the European model. And it doesn't include traditional wisdom. I heard Modesta talking about what the efforts are over there. We talk about our grandparents and the traditional wisdom that we come from, but the educational system is really lacking. It's incomplete. The national education system has evaluation methods that are limited, and we really have to include the intercultural aspect. recognizing that collective rights should be implemented based on interculturality, because in Colombia, we're a very diverse country and we have very important examples. Our community, the Inca community, community we're on the lists of communities that are under threat of extinction. The Misa community in Colombia and the communities in the Cauca, they've been resisting. They've been carrying the banner of resistance and that has benefited many communities in Colombia. We've been able to support them in certain moments. And for Latin America, we've got many resistance processes underway. It's so wonderful to be here with Modesta and to hear about her country of Bolivia, which has been an example. And it resembles our resistance process here as well in terms of defending our traditional knowledge and identity and ecofeminism when we women talk about resistance, we talk about the protection of the land. And this is a very important legacy. Even if it's incomplete, there are certain rights, but it's incomplete. So it's really wonderful to be at this gathering and feel that in some way we can do micro resistance among women who are planting and protecting their native seeds in different places. And we are part of a macro level resistance that's occurring based on our local contexts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Moskui, for your excellent speech. We want to rescue that even though the cultures, prominent cultures, try to minimize us or disappear us, the resistance of the indigenous peoples has been very strong 
if it is mobilizing, guarding the old native seeds, cultivating, planting their own, wearing their own clothes, eating their own food, and bringing in their own songs and culture. There are different ways of resistance and thanks for your presentation. Now let's go ahead to the Q&A section. But before doing that, since I have this connection issue with the internet, I didn't have the 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 opportunity to present introduce Modesta. I just wanted to say here that Modesta is a leader from Laguna Chica. It's a Guarani indigenous leader. In her own language is a Buruhicha. Modesta is the Murubicha in Laguna Chica in the Tarija department of the Bolivian Chaco in Southern Bolivia. She actively participated in the struggles to defend co territorial communities and is from the local community of Jacuí, in the Gran Chaco in Bolivia in 2001. What any woman leaders brought a lawsuit before a country's agro-environmental environmental court to obtain land titles for their ancestral lands or their ancestral lands with plenty of forests that were destroyed to plant to be a monocultive like soy and cattle ranch. Together with other Guarani indigenous leaders, women leader, they have confronted land owners in the area to deforest the region for industrial soybean products. She was part of the group of women who wrote the book Laguna Chica, Primer Territorio Ancestral, Anhelado Consolidado por la Fuerza Organizada de Mujeres Guaraníes, published in 2022. This book recounts the struggle to recover their ancestral lands and the first activities that they had they developed to recover the biodiversity in their local territory. I guess, of course, Modesta already was able to tell you about that history that I couldn't listen myself, not, nor Bernarda or Modesta, because of this internet issue access I had. I also would like to read to you some some things they are saying in the chat. For instance, in Ecuador, they had a big struggle against this oil extractivity and mining in Yasuni and the Andino, Andean Choco. On August 20, we're going to Bogota. We're going to a big consult about these two territories. If you can support signing as of organizations or people, there is the link so you can go in and sign to support this struggle from our brothers and sisters from Yasuni. So now let's go to the Q&A section. I can see some questions here. There are some questions I can see myself that there is other questions. Please, Juliana, support me because I can only see the questions from the moment I reconnected. There's one question in English that says, if the Chinese are, Modesta, please, could you mute your microphone? Can you? Mute yourself because we can listen noise. Please, Modesta, if you could mute your microphone. Okay, so the question is Are the Chinese involved in the road building and extraction too? 
I think this can be answered by Muskui. I don't know if Bernarda would like to add or the Chinese got there to Bernarda, but I know the Chinese are getting into territories in Colombia, Brazil, and Peru, and Bolivia in the northern part. I don't know if they're in the Chaco yet. If they are in the Chaco, Miss Modesta, you could also answer. Muskui? Well, until the moment, uh, I don't know everything, anything about Chinese companies here. We have Monsanto, Libero Copper, Copper, Stone American, Anglo Polo Shanti. But Ambola Shanti was some time and then they left after we protested. An American was very strong in the past too, in the exploring process. And Libero Cobre. The other ones we know they are Germans, Americans, and this one is Canadian. Regarding the projects to build roads in Latin America, we understand. When there's 10, these projects are being conducted with the national governments, but I really don't know who else is involved. Thank you. That's what I could say. Thank you. Thank you, Moscow, for your answer. Probably they are not in your territory, but yes, they are in almost every country in Latin America. The, we have Chinese present. They're putting money in roads and ports. Also train stations. Okay, so we also have uh, uh, some comment from Jamar from Venezuela saying that Putting aside Chinese interests, the biggest come from the Canadians and um, Americans, from the US. And yes, that's what has been confirmed during the presentations. There is a question for Bernarda from Paraguay, our friend from Paraguay. The question for you, Bernarda, is eucalypt planting are genetically modified what what company is doing this Bernardo do you know anything about it yes well yes they are genetically modified and When we were against the, at the beginning, when we were against the planting of these seeds, we have a struggle, a fight in the space of planting. And the woman discovered a big, a big, a big, uh, Thing full of eyes and some painting with a very disgusting author. So they put this on the line and then planted. So the woman had to throw away all this poison back then. At the beginning, we were able to fight out the responsibles that were there in the land, but they came back at us with all their strength. They hit me very, very hard, personally. I, I, there was a lot of physical violence, psychological violence because of this mega project and the 
company that led this project was Fundación Paraguaya, who's working nationally and internationally. Unfortunately, this company owns this owns a lot of political influencers, political leaders, banking leaders. They are connected to the attorney general, the judges. They call us rebels because we are against this project, against these mega projects. So what they say is that we don't want to work because we do not accept them. And that's not the issue. It's not that we don't want to work. It's like our sister from Bolivia said, from the Warami people, we protect the environment, the native trees that have been there for years. And they came to the forest our lands. They also enter one meter away of our cemetery. Forested the area. They put walls around her. And due to my way of leadership, we said we won allow they come back, they enter again, and we want to raise awareness so people understand that it's not our project to favor the community. Our community has 680 families, three clans with seven communities, and only 40 families were, were benefited it is from this and they were paid but now the money ended the project ended but they still can see the trees growing and people now realize this. it was not good but it's too late because they already so I see we need to have women leaders in Latin America, because of course we have some men that defend the environment and the territories, but they need to unite with us so we can be equal. Because these men that have signed in order to have this monocultive enter in our land, they did so. They did not re make an assembly, a community assembly. But we still know it's our right. And we will keep resisting inside our community. We know very well that the chaco from Paraguay is very dry. There were rivers. There were other sources of water and we don't have them anymore. The Eptos plantation is in the middle of our community. So communities, communities has been divided because of the new planting. They also use pesticides to in the land and that, that affects us. So they and didn't get the possibility of work to the local communities. Pesticides burned everything in the land. It's so negative. We lost our medicine plants. We lost a lot of very important plants, like cut up trees that we use to cure illnesses in the past. And, and we lost them because they decided to 
choose the area where, where we have these trees. And that is what is going on and what, that is what is happening to us. It has been worsening. Because in the past, the Paraguayan, the most known Paraguayan community is the one from Ojeros, which, and this has been a transgenic cultif, and now they want to legalize the transgenic wheat. We already have transgenic rice, transgenic corn in Paraguay, and they are also deforesting mountains, forests, they are deviating the water, rivers, the water lines because of the rice companies. So everything is being accumulated to benefit the capital. So they can have accumulation to strengthen itself. And we are being treated as, as objects and not as human beings. So the worry in Latin America and in our indigenous territories is are the rivers, culture, medicines, all this territory that has been protected so many times and transnational have their eyes on this because they know we still have these natural resources. As Juana said, we, we must say no to transnational corporations, no to genetically modified plants, no to mining, no to carbon extraction that is making people ill and giving um, a missy with the salary which is so low, so low in the Alto Chaco, in the High Chaco. This is where we are living in Paraguay. Thank you. Thank you, Bernarda, for everything you said in these short words. They are trying to to promote an ecocide law. And it's an attack on mother nature. Ecocide is the name for this. And we want all countries to support this effort to, to punish uh, the actions that Bernarda was describing. Bernarda, you talked about the Empresa Paraguaya Nacional. What was the name of the company behind the monoculture tree plantations? Fundación Paraguaya, it's called. Okay, that's the name. Because there's a ministry here that's called the Ministry of the Environment. and We've got the, they're connected with this company. Also, Indique, we've got the Paraguayan Institute of Indigenous Peoples, which is also behind these monocultures. And an organization that does patenting of seeds in Paraguay. And they are preventing the indigenous sales of medicinal plants. They ask you to have a rook in order to sell. Uh, and otherwise they say you can't do it. And they so they create obstacles for people. And uh, that's how 
they get connected. The municipality even is included. A whole there's a whole network of political support for Fundación Paraguaya. And we've got the the body, the National Body for Indigenous Peoples. Oh, so it looks as though the indigenous peoples themselves are supporting it. No, Indy always has a representative that's not indigenous. This is the, we've never had an indigenous person as the head of the indigenous body. And they just put their political buddies, right wingers in there as directors of the Indigenous Institute, and they're the ones who decide for us. This is called INDI, the institution. And that's a representative body of the state for Indigenous peoples. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that, Bernarda. And now I'd like to pass the mic to Miss Modesta Medina, would you like to add anything else? <clears throat> would you like to say any more words uh, in closure before we we begin to wrap up? If so, it, you've got the floor. Go ahead, Miss Modesta. We're hearing you. Well, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Please go ahead. Well, first I'd like to thank you for being here virtually. And you said you didn't hear me because you were disconnected for a bit and you didn't hear our sisters. But we were talking about the, the concerns that we have about our water sources. They're trying to make a tunnel here and we have a reserve for the Guarani people. The water source is not just for the Guarani people, but it's for everyone here in the region of the Chaco. And that's the main concern that we have in the Guarani community right now. The government has said that that tunnel is going to be built no matter what. Modesta, what would be your advice for all of the indigenous women? not just the Guarani, but around the world right now who are listening to you. Well, as a Guarani woman, the only thing that I would advise you is that we continue struggling, continue fighting and moving forward to achieve all that we want. And that's what I would tell my sisters who are listening that we keep working, keep fighting until we get what we want. And to really fight for the protection of our forests because they're destroying our forests. And I would encourage women to continue protecting them and fighting so that they don't mistreat our plants, As our sisters said, the traditional plants, the Guarani people also place a lot of value on our medicinal plants for our remedies. And as our sister says, they're trying to take away our right to cultivate and use these medicinal plants. So we wanna continue fighting. We don't want them 
to kill our plants. That is one of our big concerns in Laguna Chica as well. We plant our native plants like algarrobo and others. And the neighboring communities are actually deforesting this hector by hector, acre by acre, and we want to protect our territory. We want to keep moving forward. That's what I would tell my sisters around the world. I am also here as a leader in Laguna Chica, and I encourage the women here to continue protecting our forests, protecting our plants, our traditional plants, and to not spray pesticides because this is poisoning the earth. That's what I'd like to say, to really encourage everyone to continue fighting. Thank you, Modesta. Thank you for encouraging us to continue in our struggles and to keep moving forward in defending our concerns to protect Mother Nature for the future of our children and not just our children, but humanity, as we said at the outset. And so to close this discussion and this event, unless anyone has any additional questions for our participants, we will ask Ines, our colleague Ines, to do a closing of the event and a bit of a summary of what we have heard in the presentations. I would like to say, this is Bernarda speaking. Before we close, I'd like to say something. Please go ahead. We are doing a solidarity campaign to gather donations for our anniversary on August 20th. And we're gonna share a flyer with everybody who wants to donate. We haven't been able to celebrate this for the last four years. And as always, from the Colm people, we're sharing with other communities and we invite them to join us. We need econ financial resources to do the activities that we're planning. And I wanted to also share with you and just in case anyone wants to support us in this, before I forget, because I nearly forgot to mention it, we were in Paraguay here. We are doing this event, and I really wanted to share the solidarity campaign with you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Bernarda, perhaps he could... Put that information in the chat if someone wants to support how they would do that. Bernarda, can you share the link to the campaign, please? Or would you like me to help you? Yeah, could you do it, please? Because I don't know how to put it here. So this is a link to the Konamuri website, is that right? Konamuri is Bernarda's organization. And you can see now in the chat, there's a link to the effort there. And you're welcome to share this so that we can help the Com people. We've got information in the English in that link too. And that's for their anniversary party and their advocacy efforts. Thank you, Modesta, Bernarda. Thank you, Bernarda. Thank you, Valentina, for sharing the link. So we're going to invite Ines to give us a summary of the presentations. She works in Paraguay for the organization Heñoy. 
and she's the focal point for the Latin American region at the Global Forest Coalition. Ines. <clears throat> if you'd like to uh, bring us through the closing. Well, thank you very much, Juana. Thank you to everyone who's present here. I have a bit of a cold, so sorry about my scratchy voice or my sneezes <laughs> if I end up interrupting. I would like to give a special thanks to the three presenters, Bernarda, Modesta, and Muscuy. It's been very inspiring for me to hear the views from cultures that have different paradigms to the consumption-based model that we see today. And before, I'd like to just, for out of curiosity, Modesta, I'd like to ask you, Murubicha, Murubicha or Murubicha? How do you pronounce that word? Murubicha means a leader. Okay, so you say it like murubicha. Oh, in Paraguay, we have a Guarani word that we call murubicha. Mm, yes, murubicha is another way to say it. In Bolivia, we say murubicha, and in Paraguay, murubicha. Okay, well, I would like to just set out some of the concepts that our comrades have shared about what Bernarda was saying. Bernarda highlighted the political context. And I'd like to point that out. In particular, the lack context of ecocide. This is based on political decisions. And sometimes as social fighters, we maintain a certain distance, a healthy distance from the political realm. And my first, this leads me to my first reflection. The social struggle originates in the courage, the bravery, of the communities, as our colleagues told us. In Latin America, we've got 500 years of fighting. And in the global South, many, many hundreds of years of resistance to the colonial pillaging, mainly European and North American. And that resistance was born from the very bodies and the territories, the bodies that confronted arms and rape and occupation of the territories. But today, those bodies lack decision-making power in the political realm. And that's why it's important to think about a profound transformation of our political paradigms. And we've got Guillomar here representing the Venezuelan Bolivian Bolivarian revolution. And we've got to dare to think differently and commit to political projects. And Bernarda. We have much more to do. The destruction of the planet is such that we have experienced the hottest month on record. 
We've got atypical winters in the south and hot, hot summers in the north. And in China, a country that's so organized. Hundreds of people have died. The climate events that we are confronting now that we're facing We're not talking about the future. Notice the title of this gathering said, the struggle for the future of humanity. And it's necessary to achieve a possible future for humanity and also a present for humanity. How many people, how many living beings in the present This morning we were hearing the speeches by at the Amazon forum and our colleague Pablo Salon was describing the fires, forest fires and the impacts on the body. He described it with such a macabre, almost a morbid tone. And that's what we're experiencing on the planet today. That's what we're living. And that destruction, far from stopping, is really advancing. And they described it very well about the mining and Modesta, Muscui talked about the mining. Modesta talked about the issues in Bolivia. And we also heard about the monocultures in Paraguay. And it's our water, our air, our food that's at risk. And all of the living beings who rely on these elements. The predation of our nature continues to advance. And this makes our peoples and our communities vulnerable. I'm referring to the indigenous communities and also the, the communities of the global south who are pillaged and today are providing, and I'll say this in quotes, the solution for the energy transition through the extraction of lithium and the metals that are necessary to migrate from fossil fuel burning to other types of energy. And in that sense, all of the practices that our three colleagues have described were we're protecting our trees, our seeds. Bernarda spoke about crafts and artisanship. I just want to highlight a couple of things that were said about seeds, about our own primary resources, our own natural medicines. And as Muskui said, this is central the traditional knowledge that we hold and the collective defense, as she said, of the knowledge that make up our spirituality and our culture. In my opinion, what we heard today is the The verification that rebellious paradigms that go against the consumption model, they still exist. And the fact that it's women that we're hearing today, women who are leading these processes of rebellion and different models, this should strengthen our hope 
and our confidence because the challenge is of such magnitude that we need to join forces to unblock our thinking and our logics, to really break paradigms and propose the creation of a deeply transformed world, a more dignified, a more free, a more just world that's possible with the natural conditions that make that possible. And I think I might leave it there for now. And I'm just thinking, so wonderful that we can have this encounter. We are walking hand in hand for the future. And thank you so much. Thank you, Inez. Thank you for that excellent and very deep message and for your reflections, which also gathered together the comments by our three leaders. I'd like to say something in common that unites all of the indigenous peoples around the world is spirituality. And that spirituality that we see in our mother earth, our mother water, our brothers and sisters, the trees, as living beings. We know that they have their needs just like we do. They need to eat, they need to reproduce, and they even need to die. If we look at the whole cycle, as our grandparents have taught us, how different would the world be? Because then we would really respect life. That's the center of our beliefs. And that everything is living. That's also something that gives us hope in this struggle. And that really we are benefiting from the wisdom and the spirituality of indigenous peoples. And thank you so much for attending this event. We're gonna share the recording, especially the Spanish one. I have not been able to record in all of the languages, but if someone is doing that, please share. And I'm based in the Netherlands here. We imagine that we have internet issues here too. It's like, it's not really a coincidence. Maybe there's some powerful hand at work trying to block our efforts, but hey, what? I, this never happens to me. But well, my sisters, a big hug to all of you. Let's continue moving forward. I wish you strength. And we hope to see you in another event, perhaps on this date next year, if not sooner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Modesta. Thank you, Bernarda. Thank you, Moscoy, for your interventions. Thank you. Greetings to all of you. Thank you. And I wanted to take a picture with everybody who's here. I don't know if we can do that. We don't have everybody here still, but can you put your cameras on, please, everybody? So we can.